All right, let's get uh, let's get started with the second part of this session on mapping the sky uh, with uh, more galaxy surveys and then continuing all the way to the CMB. And our first speaker is uh, Juna Kohlmeier. We're delighted uh, to have you here. Uh, Juna is uh, the director of the uh, CETA, the Can Canadian Institute for Theoretical Astrophysics, as well as the founding director of the Carnegie Theoretical Astrophysics Center at the Carnegie uh, Observatories. Uh, Juna has also uh, been the director of the fifth phase of the Sloan Digital uh, Sky Survey, uh, which I believe is the first all-sky robotic survey in optical and infrared. Um, and uh, Juna has also been playing a key role in designing the next stage of spectroscopic surveys. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing all about this. Thank you, Juna. Thank you so much. Um, well, it is a real pleasure to be here. So I just want to thank the organizers uh, and the leadership for uh, inviting me. It's so happy birthday. Uh, what a celebratory event. Uh, and at these events, it's important to look to the past and also to the future. Where have we been? Why did we go there? Where are we going? And, uh, and so that'll be the spirit uh, of this talk, uh, spectroscopic surveys for the mid-century. Um, see. So a hundred years ago, uh, and of course I spent a good fraction of my career at the Carnegie Observatories and I just flew in from Pasadena. So that place just infuses you as I'm sure Roger uh, Blanford can describe. Um, the whole scale of the universe wasn't understood a hundred years ago and we're coming up on the hundredth anniversary of the discovery of that variable in M31 that said yeah, these things are really far away. These smudges are really far away. And the Milky Way is huge. So if we remember what the universe looked like in 1920, okay, you've got general relativity in 1915. You've got basically immediately the short field solution for black holes. You've got Arthur Eddington going on the eclipse saying, hey, everyone, this is a legit theory. Um, and in 1920, you have this great debate raging among astronomers. And nominally, this debate was about two things, about the size of the Milky Way galaxy and the nature of the spiral nebulae. Um, but in fact, and that's how we learn about this when we're kids in school, this is how you learn about the great debate and the, the Cepheids, et cetera. But in fact, that's not what the debate was about. So the great debate, was really about the scale of the known universe. So you had Curtis on the one hand, who thought the Milky Way was small. So he was wrong about that, the Milky Way is big. But because he thought the Milky Way was small, he thought obviously the smudges, the spiral nebulae must be external to it because that's not a big deal. You can fit in a bunch of little galaxies in this little universe. And Shapley thought the Milky Way was large. He was like, we've got these variable stars. This is a big galaxy we're dealing with. But obviously you can't have a big galaxy and all a bunch of other big galaxies, like that can't happen. So the nebulae must be internal to the Milky Way. So I, I go through this story because I think it's a really important uh, uh, lesson for all of us in this struggle to understand what the universe actually is. We're all right and wrong all the time, every day. And, um, and I think that we can really collectively suffer from these comprehension blocks. Like we think something's rock solid. Like if you went in 1920 with like, you know, a cigar and a glass of like absinthe and said, guys, like you agree that the Milky Way is like the universe is small. They'd be like, yeah, we agree on that. It's just the Cepheid, it's just the Milky Way is little, but you know, then they would get into some little, you know, minutia. <laughs> But in fact, they, what they agreed on was the thing that was wrong. And of course, um, it was really the theorists to the rescue, as always. Uh, <laughs> uh, thinking about a dynamic universe, and this is very Kaipak, uh, as you guys embark on this incredible LSST Rubin journey of the video of the sky and the importance of the time dimension in all of the things that we're studying. Um, and so 
these, you know, Friedman and the Matva, they propose the expanding universe. They think about the primeval atom. And of course, at this time, as you know, there's this grappling of atomic physics and this incredible explosion of what we're understanding about the atom. I mean, no pun intended, um, but also trying to understand uh, gravity more deeply through Einstein. So it's just this, this incredible time intellectually. So even if there's no hardware, we can still travel intellectually. And that's why we all have to proselytize the importance of mathematics in uh, our children and other people's children. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm like an evangelist. Like you should definitely not let me in if you're not interested in math. Okay, uh, but going to, uh, to Hubble in period, this is of course 1924, there were 24 galaxies in this original graph, in this first map, this first cosmic map had so few galaxies and okay, it was not right, perfectly right. And everyone likes like, well, Hubble was wrong about the scale and like, whatever. Um, the realization that actually there was this dynamic aspect to the universe is one that I think we're still trying to understand theoretically. We're still trying to understand it more deeply. Uh, and that's not just the universe, but everything in the universe, this just dynamism and the importance of the time uh, variable. And as we start doing these, you know, this mapping thing, it's like a pretty good gig. You like learn a lot of stuff with this mapping. Uh, and so people tried to map more and more. And of course, through the 70s, raise your hand if you were born when this paper, 1977, was published. All right. It's not, a sh you, raise your hand, like you were totally born. <laughs> a recalcitrant group. <laughs> but anyway, the point is that when people first, like remember this time, none of us remember this. So when we say we remember it, we've heard through the stories written and oral uh, about what it was like in this time. I was not actually born yet. Uh, close though, I was, I was being thought about, I think. Um, maybe not. I, I was an accident. Anyway, um, they're, they're, when Thick Man comes out, the universe is not smooth. There is not homogeneity. There is not is isotropy. It, there is clump. There are clumps. What's going on with all of these clumps? What is up with the Great Wall? What is up with all of this incredible structure? And of course, people were struggling with the CMB clumps and just this lumpiness. Of, so the universe thankfully is not just a smooth static blob. Like that is the most boring thing we could have had. And instead we have this lumpy, icky, dynamic thing. And that is really fantastic. And, and, and of course, struggling with these lumps is what it's all about, uh, you know, at the basic level. So how do you map all the galaxies? Now, there were lots of arguments about Stickman and what it meant, and well, well, maybe if it was homogeneous on larger scales, what was going on? Okay, well, these are still small scales, even though this was incredibly transformative. So the idea was, well, how do you map all the galaxies? I mean, that's basically the theme of the latter part of the 20th century. How do you map all the galaxies? And of course, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, um, which I'm honored to be uh, part of now, um, they had this very simple mission, map one million galaxies for everyone. Uh, and of course, the Sloan Telescope was built specifically with that purpose. Uh, the famous uh, camera, which I think is now in the Smithsonian, that Jim Gunn there with brilliant graduate students uh, and staff that were able to make this incredibly painstaking system work. There were people whose jobs it was to plug plates right, these metal plates where we put fiber optic cables and then, you know, look at the sky. Okay, that was their job to plug those. And they succeeded plugging over a million times to make the largest, uh, at that time, uh, map. And of course, going from Stickman to, um, to the full galaxy distribution was the revolution that uh, industrialized uh, surveys really showed how you could do it. People had tried to do these maps of the sky before, but it's really the digital revolution that made it actually possible because we could share the data. Like the one thing that we still don't do as well as, well, like maybe many things, but one of the things we don't do as well as 
uh, the machines is share. And we gotta get better at that as humans, but that's another talk. Um, so the other thing that was just so crucial to the SCSS philosophy was if you love your data, set it free. So they made their data publicly available and they made tools so that people could use the data. So while I was waiting for the collaboration as a graduate student to do stuff and I was getting impatient because I'm an impatient person, uh, I was able to use the public data to make a catalog because I didn't want to wait for them. And in fact, then they used the catalog that I made to do something else internal to the survey. So it made the survey better to, be, to release your data. So I really applaud the public release of, of, of all data. And of course, this is, this is now an outdated figure, but there have been over 12,000 papers with SDSS data, uh, millions of queries per year. Uh, I think it's true that the galaxies are amazing and the galaxy maps are amazing, but this is a different type of revolution that I think is, uh, is uh, perhaps even more uh, profound. And of course, the Moore's law in transistors is almost the same thing as the Moore's law for galaxies. So, you know, if you look at those early, uh, those early plots in 19, you know, the stick man uh, from the 70s, and then SDSS kicks around in around year 2000, and then we keep on, we keep on going. And in principle, you can actually map all the big galaxies anyway by around 2060 if we continue to map at the uh, speed that we're mapping. Now you're like, well, that's a great thing, but you know, why, you know, why do that? <laughs> like there's other things we can do between now and 2060. Like why do these spectroscopic maps? Um, and so I, I think this is the reason. And I, I, I particularly, you know, I specifically made a really bad figure here <laughs> because I want you to understand that this picture on the one hand is incredibly astounding, like the fact that we can describe the universe in just so few parameters and that we can measure those parameters so precisely is just an insane achievement of our species. And so all of you people who like raised your hand before, like bravo, like that's incredible achievement. Um, but for, for those of us who are looking, um, you know, into the more distant future and now getting to an age where you kind of see both sides of it, um, this is really unsatisfying. Like, I don't like telling um, kindergartners about dark energy and dark matter, because it's been a while since we figured out that those essences existed. Uh, and I feel like our job, this next generation's job, is to figure that out, is to figure it out. So these big questions still, what is the universe? So we think most of it's you no know, dark and like not normal. Most of it's not probed. So we'd like to probe it now and we should probe it with all means necessary. Uh, of course, we think that there's this inflationary period uh, followed uh, following a dense phase and then an expansion phase followed by an acceleration phase. We have these multiple periods of inflation. That's weird. That's a weird thing. And we haven't been able to access before this, this early uh, inflationary period spectroscopically. And what, I'm, what I want, if you take away nothing from the talk besides the Lemaitre debate, um, <laughs> I would like you to, uh, to, to really be excited about the fact that the inflationary period may crack open in the next decade. And that's freaking cool. That's super cool. Uh, because it's the first crack in this like, edifice this like you know in 2001 space odyssey where there's like the obelisk and it's just like what's going on here and then there's a crack and this is it um so i mean dark energy is the cosmological constant is like yeah the equations work like that's okay mathematically um but the deeper physical attribute we would like like the obvious thing it should be it isn't so that tells us that there's something deeper or we think that that tells us uh, that's something deeper. I mean, historically, whenever you've had a situation like that, there's been something deeper. So, you know, unless we're at a special time and we don't think we are, then there should be something deeper. Um, you know, and at the risk of saying something controversial, but also in defense of astronomy, uh, dark matter has only been cracked open from an astrophysical, from astrophysical observation. So there's just been, we've just tried tried and been so clever and smart and creative about trying to get this thing in the lab and to, 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 to somehow 
grab a hold of it. And we failed. And we need to continue to do the astrophysical piece in order to get, because no one is, when you say, well, when, will you believe in neutrino mass measurement from, uh, you know, when will you believe that? People, particle physicists will say, when I have a lab measurement. <laughs> so we need to use the astrophysics to inform better the experimental work because the experimental work is too hard, it's too expensive, it's too big to be just probing all of this space. So in terms of these radical thresholds in this galaxy surveying, so of course that first period was the getting the expansion of the universe. Then of course we have SDSS and we found you know, dark matter, dark energy, baryon acoustic oscillations. Uh, in the last phase, this is sort of stage one to four here. In the last phase, we've been doing this only with galaxies. So instead of having to rely on the cosmic microwave background or other probes, we're able to get at dark matter and dark energy purely with the galaxy distribution. And in this next phase, the exciting thing, you're here with the DESI survey, which you guys are a part of and, and, and a critical part of, um, we're in the mega mapping phase. So really getting at inflation uh, and non-Gaussianity specifically by looking at the detailed distribution of galaxies. So why is this possible? Um, so this is enabled by these robotic focal planes. So I showed at the beginning of my talk uh, some robots that we developed as part of the SCSS5 program. Uh, this is the DESI focal plane. There's 5,000 robots in this focal plane at Kid Peak. Uh, this is one of two SCSS5 focal planes. Uh, this is 500 robots that each carry three uh, fibers uh, in two hemispheres. Um, so what is the mid-century spectroscopic experiment? So SDSS, it, historically for galaxies, uh, and now SDSS in phase five has moved on to other astrophysics, but historically, you know, it's sort of shown there. That's what we probed with SDSS with those millions of redshifts. DESI, which, which is now going faster than scheduled, which is an incredible, uh, incredible operation, is probing out e even further. And stage five, promises to probe into the, uh, the high redshift regime, really looking at redshifts five and six in order to get closer to those linear modes. Oh, wow, I better go. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so, so just, to, just to kind of give you a scale of this, if these are the number of modes uh, that your uh, that your number of linear modes that, modes that you're probing as a function of redshift, DESI is probing kind of in this range. Stage five, what we're calling stage five spectroscopy, is getting up to uh, to many many uh, times those modes. And of course, we know that we're looking for something very hard to find, which is why we need to find all of those modes. Um, I'm going to skip this, but this is from some of a lot of the work. Uh, in the snow mass process uh, showed uh, a lot of the pa white papers from that process showed how uh, phase five spectroscopy was going to, uh, or stage five spectroscopy was going to affect things like inflation and dark energy. And this is just to show how in these sort of figures of merit, FNL, A linear R, uh, how uh, uh, stage five spectroscopy compares. And you can kind of see that the great thing about using the spectra is that you probe both dark energy and inflation. So you probe these two epics of, uh, uh, of cosmic expansion. Um, it, I would be remiss if I didn't say anything about how this works. So of course, in stage one to four, you, you, know, you, you had, um, you had these, this infrastructure that was built, but then you actually also, you build these things and other things come from them. So now we're doing the SDSS-5 program, which is mostly astrophysics, black holes, astrophysics, stellar astrophysics, no longer doing galaxy mapping on the Sloan uh, surveys. Right now you've got the DESI instrument that's working uh, on uh, at uh, NOIR lab at uh, the Kitt Peak Telescope on a four meter platform. To go to this next stage, the stage five phase, um, you to probe inflation, you really need a uh, six and a half meter or you need a, a, a new type of facility. Uh, I'm gonna skip over uh, SDSS-5, but please do ask me questions about it uh, just to show how you know, there's more to the universe than just galaxies. Galaxies are made of stars and gas and probing that from an astrophysics perspective is 
incredibly uh, exciting and interesting. So it's just one minus uh, W here. Uh, and we get to build a lot of cool hardware as part of these projects. And I think this is an incredibly important part of the training of astrophysicists. I think KaiPak does a wonderful job having theorists and experimentalists and observers all together. I think that's really great. Um, but just to say like where this is all headed, uh, if you look at kind of the, um, the speed of these programs compared to the stage one SDSS, uh, something like DESI upgraded is about a factor of 50. The sort of DESI current uh, is, is about a factor of 20 compared to SDSS. Something like a mega mapper stage five facility is a factor of several hundred uh, compared to SDSS. Um, lots of different ways to achieve stage five spectroscopy. Um, my inspiration is Galileo on this. Um, so when he publishes Sidereus Nuncius in 1610, he says the number of fixed stars which observers have been able to see uh, without artificial powers of sight up to this day can be counted uh, is therefore decidedly great feat to add to their number and to set distinctly before the eyes all other stars in myriads which have never been seen before and which surpass the old previously known stars in number more than 10 times. So that's like right there in Sidereus Nuncius, you can read it. Uh, like once you get past the many pages where he's uh, like kind of like really kissing up to Cosmo de' Medici in a sort of gross way. But anyway, this is where, this is where 10 X or die comes from. The next 10 X or die was Galileo. That's like, that's our mandate. Like it's come from Sidereus Nuncius to us. And that's sort of the philosophy that guides uh, this mega mapper project that I've been helping to develop uh, 26,000 fiber robots instead of 5,000 or a uh, thousand on a six and a half meter telescope in Chile to have overlap with, um, uh, with Ruben. This needs to be ambitious. Uh, we'd like it to be achievable. So, you know, it's great to spend time on a lot of technical things, but as an impatient person, I like mid scale projects that you can uh, kind of do. Um, faster, better, cheaper. And then it finally, just in homage to, uh, uh, to the early leadership of KaiPak, uh, Tom, Risa, others, like this is from Risa's website. This is one of the, I really think that the advances that you guys have pushed in terms of statistics, in terms of analysis tools, in terms of simulations has been crucial for the field. Uh, and so I will end on this, uh, map them all, the machine will know its own. And uh, with that, uh, I just thank you very much and happy birthday to Kai Pak. Thank you. Thank you for a really exciting talk. Uh, questions for Juna. I know we have a lot of questions on my- It's own. okay if you don't have questions. I, you don't I, feel compelled. I do have a ton, but yeah. Um, What's the most exciting science that you're expecting from Sloan 5? Oh, Do you have a favorite? Oh my gosh, thank you so much. That was a great question. Um, so Sloan 5 has three mappers, the Milky Way mapper, the black hole mapper, and the local volume mapper. And their focus is, uh, well, like me, it's completely not focused. Uh, so uh, so in, terms of the three, uh, in terms of the three mappers, I think for black hole mapper, so each one has its separate kind of experiment. Uh, I do think that that's where the DOE infused an experimental perspective to astronomy. So uh, the particle physicists really helped out because it was like, hey, look at this cool thing and look at this cool thing. Like we get really distracted and they were like, no, focus, focus up. And that has been very important for SDSS and for SDSS5. So we have three mappers. In the black hole mapper, we're really interested in how, how black holes grow in the accretion phase. So looking at time domain spectroscopy to understand how black holes grow and evolve and get their masses really precisely at high and low masses. This Milky Way mapper is aimed at understanding how the Milky Way formed. The thing I'm personally most excited about and the reason I kind of signed up to lead uh, uh, SDSS-5 was because I wanna understand the progenitors of the LIGO sources and the gravitational wave sources. And it's just, you know, when people say, oh, it's so hard to get the binary fraction, like LIGO is hard, 
that's now the de that's the bar for experimentally hard. Like whenever we say it's hard to get binary fraction, what we're saying is like, we're lazy. And so with SDSS5, we are not lazy. We are looking at binaries across the, co the, the color magnitude diagram in order to actually make this empirical boundary condition so we can understand what gives rise to all of the gravitational wave sources. The local volume mapper um, speaks to my interest in the formation and evolution of galaxies and what, like, it is time that we stop talking about feedback like and not really know what's happening. Many different models at the subgrid level make the right galaxy luminosity function. And again, that's deeply unsatisfying because it's just a theoretical degeneracy and one that we have the tools to break. And so that's the that's what I'm really excited about, that we're going to look at the energy injection scale of the Milky Way. And all of our hardware is online and working, which you know, uh, building stuff through a pandemic, as you guys know, is hard. We had, you know, people accepting uh, <laughs> packages and building stuff in their driveways. I mean, it was crazy. Um, so SDSS-5 is just such a broad uh, gift of spectroscopy to the universe that it, I can't say just one, but you should join. You should join us. <laughs> oh. You mentioned that uh, oh, actually, the, uh, the energy can be fully mathematically explained as a cosmological constant, but that's not just. Can you give us a few of your own favorite things that might be satisfying that might occur? About I mean, my favorite thing. Uh, could was... you please repeat the question? Oh, yeah. So the question is you know, you said you're unsatisfied with the cosmological constant, so what do you think would be satisfying? And I think that I still. Um, I guess I'm still, I still want to understand why it's not the vacuum energy, actually, like that bothers me, the fact that that doesn't work. <laughs> um, and so like, that's a, that's a very kind of intuitive sense that there's, there might be something deeply wrong uh, in terms of that calculation that, uh, that, um, you know, and, and uh, ill understood. I think that, um, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, you know, he asked my favorite. He didn't ask the truth. <laughs> um, but I, I do think that, um, I think we actually are, there's the, the issue isn't, it's not that there aren't like good ideas out there. It's like, what's the weight that you can put towards any one idea or another? Um, for myself, uh, I, I just have, a, I just don't like it. Um, I'm not a string theorist, so I'm not doing the, the, uh, those calculations myself. Uh, but I, I don't like that the, I think we don't understand something about the vacuum. I think we don't understand something about the, the, the broader universe. All right, you say, you say. So uh, what's your view then of the multiverse, et cetera, which has uncountable vacuum. Yeah. And the improper cosmological principle leads us, as Weinberg showed, right. okay, to a small one. Right. Um, Is that unacceptable? I mean, it, from what perspective? Like, it's, I, I think it's, I think, I don't think there's anything wrong in the arguments, the right? Fact. Yeah, so I don't think it's, I don't think that it's any, I don't think that there's, um, I don't think that there's, that the, the arguments are flawed. Is that, is that, is that, um, I, I mean, I, I think that, yeah, can I sink my teeth into that? Like, no, and the reason why it's not acceptable, I guess I'll just say it, no, it's not acceptable. And the reason is, the reason is because there's still there's still science on the table. And that is once we map these galaxies at these redshifts, okay, and we find out, hey, it's vanilla. Sorry, that's the universe you drew. You're a loser. You got the lame universe or whatever, the anthropic, like, okay, fine. I'll accept that. And actually, I'll be proud of that because it, we didn't leave anything on the table. But until we actually do those measurements we're just saying well i'm fine with that like let's move on and whether you're fine with that just depends on your um stomach acid i think fundamentally <laughs> you know like are you okay with that or you're not like i'm not but you know i'm a jumpy person <laughs>
Yeah, I wanted to ask about, I want to give you an opportunity to talk more about Megamapper. Yes. And tell us like more about uh, what would it focus on? What telescope would it use? Is it trans, like, following up on transients from LSST or what is it? Doing? Yes, to all those questions. Uh, so this is the Megamapper concept. Um, oh, okay. Um, um, so let me just share screen really quickly. Uh, and um, So this is the Megamapper concept. Um, there's different ways we can achieve stage five spectroscopy. There's not one way to map. Like, let's do all the mapping. Let's find the way that'll actually work. Let's find the way we can afford. So like, I want a Ferrari, but I drive a Prius because I can't afford a Ferrari yet. So, <laughs> so, um, so the Mega Mapper is a six and a half meter telescope. Uh, you, there are other concepts that use larger telescopes. they are billion dollar concepts. This is meant to be a mid-scale project. So under $300 million. Uh, it's basically a wide field clone of the Magellan telescope design. So it has a lot of heritage, a lot of, there's a lot of well-tested um, engineering. People can just make these turnkey. That's a terrible figure. I apologize. That's really low resolution. Uh, the focal plane would have 26,000 fibers. Wouldn't all be full, filled with galaxies. So in terms of your um, thinking about the Milky Way, and this is where uh, Risa and her group and you, Greg, and you know people who are interested in um, understanding, mean, we're just going to murder the Milky Way spectroscopically, of course. Um, and <laughs> I'm peaceful. Um, anyway, <laughs> um, although, anyway, um, I think we need a new way to think about mapping the halo and the near environment of the Milky Way. And so I always say all the stars because we need to find new statistics and Tom and his, where's Sandy? Where's, where is he? Is he still? There you go. So his paper that just came out about this KNN statistic where we're trying to have new statistical ways to understand uh, galaxy distributions where we can use those same types of things in the stellar field. Just You're just probing a density field. It's all you're doing is probing a density field. Um, when you think about having every star in the local volume and probing that, that's the type of, those are the types of things that we, we wanna think about for near field cosmology. Let's do near field cosmology like the way the CMB folks do cosmology, um, the way the large scale structure mapping folks do cosmology. Let's, let's, let's murder it. Um, let's get to the floor. Uh, and so that's the sort of basic overview. They feed into DESI spectrographs. So the DESI spectrographs are wonderful instruments. I know I'm out of time like, by a lot, so I'm gonna stop. Please ask me questions uh, at lunch and afterwards. And thank you again uh, so much. Thank you so much. <laughs>